Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all the authority and splendor it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, Away from me, Satan. It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. In this talk, we're going to see how Jesus was tempted by the devil, so that we won't be outwitted by his evil schemes. To put today's reading into context, let's see the lead up to Jesus' temptation by reading Mark's account. And this is chapter 1, verse 9. Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptised by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descend on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once, straight away, the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for forty days being tempted by Satan. So we see there that Jesus was transported from the tranquility of a river to the desolation of a desert. One minute, the voice of God. The next, the voice of Satan. The reassuring tones of affirmation were immediately followed by the corrosive lure of temptation. Such stark and rapid turnarounds are not uncommon. Remember when Peter was inspired by God to declare to Jesus, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then in the very same chapter, Jesus rebuked Peter with, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. And then likewise for us today, in a moment, we can be swept from the highest mountaintop experiences to the lowest valley depths. So it's important that we ground ourselves on the one true constant, the steadfast love and faithfulness of God our Father. See, our highs can turn on a sixpence, often from circumstances that are beyond our control. But we can control the tempo of our lives if we rest in the shadow of the Almighty. And so instead of lurching from one reaction to the next, we can be more circumspect, as William Cowper's hymn puts it, Oh, for a closer walk with God, a calm and heavenly frame. The Israelites had their fair share of ups and downs as they wandered through the desert. And for what purpose? Uh, to what end? Well, it says in 1 Corinthians 10 that these things happened to them as examples. They were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So, if you think you are standing firm, take heed and be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you 
except that is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Now, we shouldn't go around putting ourselves into temptation's way. Now, different people will be susceptible to different temptations. And for sure, God knows exactly where each of our particular weaknesses lie. But crucially, do you know where your weaknesses lie? You see, we will be far better equipped if you know both our strengths and weaknesses. For our strengths, we need to pray constantly for humility, never forgetting to lean wholly upon him, because without God, we can do nothing. And then as for our weaknesses, we need to lay these at the foot of the cross, where Jesus can turn them into his opportunities. But brace yourselves for the ride of your life, because God's power, his miracle-making might, is made perfect in weakness. But don't panic. When we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit, we're in good hands. Keep in step with the Spirit and let him be your guide. When Jesus was filled with the Spirit, where does the Spirit lead him? Again, going back to our reading in Luke 4, verse 1. Full of the Holy Spirit, Jesus left Jordan and was led by the Spirit led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. And so clearly God is not in the business of removing temptation while here below. Now this account gives us insight into when Satan is likely to attack us. When we are alone and then when also we're at our weakness, we're, when we're at our weakest be it from hunger, ill health, or emotional trauma. But the Bible exhorts us in James chapter 4 to resist the devil. And when you do this, he will flee from you. But there are important caveats both before and after this crucial verse. First, you must submit yourselves to God. Then resist the devil and he will flee from you. And then the very next verse, draw near to God. You see, this very pattern we see in today's story. Now, Jesus submitted himself to God as he went through the waters of baptism. And then he went on to resist the devil. And then when the devil left, angels came and attended him. In other words, they let the devil fled and Jesus drew near to God. But he'll be back. You see, today's reading ended with a very sinister cliffhanger. Verse 13 of Luke 4. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Now this is a timely reminder that when Satan is done with tempting you, don't imagine that that's the end of the matter. No. We need to continue to be alert. For our enemy, the devil, continues to prowl around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So let's look at the three ways in which he tempted the Lord Jesus. Firstly, Satan tempted Jesus to eat. If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. But Jesus refused, even though he was hungry. See, to have turned stone into bread would have been to place his personal physical needs ahead of his obedience and trust in God. And so this tells me that we need to perhaps reorder our priorities in life if our confidence in God is not our supreme ambition in life. You see, we must weigh things up with eternity in the balance as opposed to just measuring one temporary matter against another temporary matter. Now this is how Paul puts it in his letter to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 16 
though outwardly we are wasting away, that is physically, and yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, that is spiritually, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And so we fix our eyes not on what is uh, sorry, we don't fix our eyes on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. You see, the quick and easy route in life is seldom the right route. And so beware of Satan's temptation to satisfy the here and now over the heavenly and eternal. So anyway, Satan failed to tempt Jesus by appealing to his physical needs. And so he tried to get him on personal ambition instead. Satan tempted Jesus with instant splendour. Remember he said in Luke 4 verse 5, the devil led him up to this high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, all this and all the authority and splendour will be yours if you worship me. Now the point I want to make here is, don't be tempted by the shortcut. Hadn't God already promised your house and your kingdom will endure forever? Now, it may well be that the kingdoms of today are not in the right hands right now. But Jesus will indeed rule the nations once again. But Jesus here, he didn't take the shortcut of bypassing Calvary when Satan tempted him with immediate possession of all the kingdoms through this one single act, if you bow down and worship me, said Satan. And so clearly, the end does not justify the means. And for a good example of this, we see David's journey to his kingship. You see, while he was just a king in waiting, David repeatedly turned down the opportunity to do away with Saul, the, the incumbent king. See, when David and his men were deep inside this cave, Saul later wandered in to relieve himself. And then David's men whispered, this is your chance, your God-given chance to do away with Saul. But when David crept upon him, he just cut off the corner of his robe. And then there was a the time when David took Saul's spear, which was right by his side as he lay fast asleep. And so by these acts of mercy, David demonstrated how he put the course of his life into the capable hands of his living God for him to do the right thing and at the right time. And so here's a challenge for you. Will you commit to trust in God to direct your paths, knowing that the way of obedience can often be long and difficult? I mean, as David himself testified from personal experience, Psalm 37, commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the new noonday sun. So beware of Satan's temptation to accomplish good things, but by questionable means. And then thirdly, Satan tempted Jesus to jump. So the devil led him to this high point in the temple if you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. But Jesus answered, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So what is it to test the Lord? Isn't that what Gideon did with his fleece? Were his actions a good example for us to follow today? I mean, can we conclude that it was right purely on the basis that God went along with it? 
Now, my personal leaning uh, towards is towards this commentator who put it this way. He says, do not presume upon the goodwill of God by demanding proof. Or put another way, don't push your luck with the Lord God. If God gives you an inch, don't take a mile. Who would dare to string God along and test his patience? Now, this may well be a lack of faith on my part, but if you are embarking on a course of action that has an unquestionable and questioning reliance on some divine intervention, then I will say proceed with caution, because on the face of it, it looks like you may be putting the Lord your God to the test. Now, for discerning God's will for our lives, the surest guide that we have is the Bible. So let's now turn to the final section of today's message, God's Word. From all three attacks of the devil, it is clear that he knows the scriptures as well. But each time, even though Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and amply able to freestyle his response, he chose to meet each temptation with the written Word of God. And so this alone gives us ultimate confidence in the authority of God's word. But the question is, do we pick up the sword of the Spirit as often as we should? Have we hidden it in our hearts? Or do we just hope to freestyle our way out of trouble and just wing it when Satan fires his fiery arrows at us? You see, all the scriptures that Jesus quoted are indeed from the book of Deuteronomy. They were the maxims and precepts used in the education of every Hebrew child. Now these verses may well have been ancient scripts, even in New Testament times. But the Lord God is, the, sorry, the word of God is alive. It is active and it speaks a truer word today than the most insightful words of any man. You see, its pages may be bound by the spine, but its words are not bound by time. And so I implore you, dear friends, love the word. Treasure it. Hold it dear to your hearts and read it every day. So do you delight in the word of God? If not, then pray. Pray for renewed taste buds. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. That's a verse from Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, which most fittingly is an ode to the beauty of God's word. Probably uh, the most famous verse in Psalm 119 is verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. But there are many other gems about the Bible's unparalleled worth and how we should be viewing it. And let me just highlight a handful of them as examples for you. For instance, verse 14, I rejoice in following your statues as one rejoices in great riches. Verse 16, I delight in your decrees. Verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. And in verse 114, I have put my hope in your word. So how much do you really value the Bible? I mean, look at verse 72. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands pieces of silver and gold. Now, why is that? As it says in verse 52, because I find comfort in them. Verse 89, your word is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Verse 138. The statutes you have laid down are fully trustworthy. And then verse 165. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. And so at the end of the day, verse 96 puts it so beautifully to all perfection. I see a limit but your commands are boundless. 
Now, if you don't quite see eye to eye with these verses, then please make it your prayer. Verse 18. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. My time is up. So what can we draw from these three temptations? So first, be mindful of your spiritual needs. You see, life is much more than just bread alone. Secondly, be patient. Don't be tempted by the shortcut, but allow God to unfold the events of your life in his good time. And then thirdly, God is to be trusted, not tested. Throughout life's ups and downs, lean on the promises of God's unchanging word. That is, the written word that we have in our hands, but also the word that became flesh, the Lord our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And so let me finish by reading from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God bless you all.